Well, good morning again to everyone. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you to all of those who are joining us from around the world. As mentioned in the introduction, I have several years experience in education in Eastern Europe, in United States public schools and urban areas, and now here in the Dominican Republic, where I work in both more rural schools and a few in cities implementing education programs. So the tools I'm going to talk about today are definitely tools that I have seen work with children from a really wide variety of backgrounds and a really wide variety of skill ranges. So I do hope that you're able to take away one or two things at least that are useful to you and that you can use either in your own classroom or school or wherever you may be. Um, sorry. OK. So before we really get started talking about specific tools, I did want to address a couple general questions about what are didactic materials in general and what their purpose is. Because <clears throat> I think these are two concepts that are really important to have clear before we get into the specific tools. So the first question I wanted to, for us to kind of consider is what are exactly didactic materials and what are they not? And I think that's important because especially in the last 10 or 20 years, as technology becomes more widely available and is geared more and more towards educational purposes, if you're talking in schools or on a higher level in ministries of education, a lot of the focus is on what technologies can we put in classroom to help our students learn? What kind of tools like iPads and computers and Promethean boards can help our students learn better? And obviously, those are amazing tools. And they are great when the resource is available. But I've certainly worked in areas, and I assume that some of you do as well, where that is just simply not a reality. That's not something that's going to be accessible. So we need to continue to think about tools that we can create that are very cheap, that are very easy to access, um, that can still teach our kids the same types of skills that a computer might be able to, and can still increase their level of academic achievement. So with that in mind, any type of didactic tool should be something that helps make an abstract concept concrete. We know that most students, especially when we're talking about younger learners, learn best when it's something that they can touch, they can see, they can feel, um, instead of just hear. And the truth is that traditionally, a lot of the classroom instruction was auditory. We expected kids to learn how to add or subtract from hearing someone talk about it and maybe doing it on a board. But we do know that that's not necessarily the way that most learners actually learn. Um, so we need to think about things that can take something very abstract, like the idea of reading, and make it concrete for our students so that they are able to really gain uh, academic abilities. And then the other thing about that levels of students. So it might be a game that starts by teaching you how to add and subtract, but if you learn how to use it, later you can use it to teach multiplication and addition. And obviously, this has multiple benefits. One, it makes your life easier as a teacher, because you don't have to recreate new tools and new activities every time you're teaching a new concept. And two, it allows teach, uh, students to be able to use the same type of you know, the knowledge they've learned about playing a specific game to build on other skills. So those are some things to keep in mind as far as what a didactic tool should be. And then we also need to consider what we hope our students are achieving and how our classroom is being improved by the use of different materials. Obviously, we want it to engage students. As I mentioned before, we want it to be something which allows them to interact with the concepts that they're learning. Uh, we also wanted to promote independence. All of these activities that I'm going to be sharing with you today are something that students could learn, uh, could use to learn, and then use to teach themselves specific skills, or at least to practice them. And that's really important, because we want our students to start thinking of themselves as active learners, as people who can teach themselves certain things and aren't always reliant on the, a teacher or another adult in their life to help them improve academically. And then along with that, the other thing we want to consider is individualized instruction. 
Um, if you're in a classroom like I was often where you have 30 plus kids who are all over the place in terms of their levels, a lot of times you're going to need to teach specific lessons to specific kids. Uh, and you need to figure out what you're going to do with the other, say, 24 students in your classroom while you're doing that small group lesson. And so as you introduce these activities and these skills that we're going to talk about, those are something that kids can do in small groups individually, and they can occupy themselves in that way and really be you know, doing rigorous work while the teacher is working with a smaller group of students. And I bring, and finally, I just want to mention that it's really important to, as a teacher, consider what your goal is in terms of the specific activity or tool you're using. Because a pitfall often can be, and I certainly did this when I first started out in education, is to come up with a really creative or a really exciting game and introduce it to your classroom, but to not have really clearly thought about what skill it is you want your children to learn. So they might be engaged, but they're actually not learning a whole lot. Okay, so now we're going to talk specifically about tools for teaching math. Um, but before we do that, I have a question that I would like to ask all of you in regards to what areas you find your students struggle most with math. So I believe Monica is going to send the question to you, and then you can select one of the three responses, which is either number sense, computational skills, or more word problem type. And once you've answered, I'll be able to see everyone's responses. OK, I see a lot of, almost all of you said word problems. So a lot of times what I find is that students struggle with word problems because they don't have very solid number sense and they don't have very solid computational skills. So the three types of activities that I am going to put here are something that can help them with those particular um, abilities and that I think if those are really well developed then you will see that their ability to do word problems really increases once they have a good sense of what it means to add for example because a lot of students see the sign that's a little cross and they know that they're supposed to you know count up or they see the number that the sign that's a line and they know they're supposed to count down but they don't really have a good sense of what adding or subtracting means they don't understand that you're getting a bigger quality quantity excuse me if you're adding and a smaller quantity if you're subtracting. So back to this slide, these are beads that are a base of 10 beads that if you are at all familiar with Montessori, I'm sure you've seen. Um, the first bead obviously represents a 1. The second string of beads represents a 10. The third is a group of 100. And the fourth is a group of thousands. So, they're really easy to make. All it is is wire and little beads. Um, so you can pretty much I can get those. They're pretty widely available, and you can put this together. It does take some time at first, but it's really useful, again, in taking this idea of numbers, which is really abstract, and making it in some way concrete for the students. And activities you can do with them once they have these beads, for example, is you, or you might notice that a lot of children have trouble counting by 10. And if you say, let's count by 10, let's go 10, 20, 30, you ask them for the next number, they might say something like 31. Because they don't understand what it means to count by 10. All they know is to go the next number up. So you can use these beads to help them grasp that concept. You give them one string of beads, that's 10. You give them the next, that's 20. You give them the next, 30. Then you ask them what's next, and they'll be able to see because they can visually see that there's 10 beads each time you're counting that the next number should be 40. Um, and so they're really they're distinguishing between counting by 10 and counting by 1. For more advanced students, perhaps, you want them to give you, show you what, that they know what it, the number, for example, 921 means. They can't grab 9 of the 1 beads to show that 900. They have to grab 9 of the 100 beads to show 900 and then two of the tens, and obviously one of the ones. And so this is a really good way to show them what does 100 mean. It's obviously a larger, 900 is a much larger quantity than 90, and even more so than 9. And so again, this is a really good basic place to start with number sense. OK, next, number cards. 
And these are really probably the easiest and cheapest material that I'm going to present during this webinar because all you need is paper and a marker. And you can see on the slide there's cards, there's three cards there, but what you do is you take your cards and you just need to make a set that has every number from zero, oops, zero to nine. Um, and you need a set for each child. And then the game that they can play with this is they put their two decks of cards together, they shuffle them, and they each of them then choose three from the deck at random, and they see which of them can make the largest number. So obviously, in this example that you see on the slide, the child who got those three cards should have realized right away that if they put the nine first, that they're going to win because that's the and unless the other child has a nine, because that's the highest digit, it's going to have the greatest place value in the hundreds place. And they shouldn't put it in the ones place. And obviously, the seven should go second and the four last, because it's going to have the, you know, you want your smallest digit in the place value with the smallest amount of, in the ones place, sorry. Um, but you would be, it's surprising how many children really struggle with this concept and maybe put the seven first and the nine second. Because they don't don't really understand the value of a number depending on whether it's in the ones, tens, or hundreds. Uh, and so this is a really good way, obviously, for them because they want to win. So they're going to be more motivated to figure out how to use their cards strategically to get them to begin to understand the idea that as you move up in place value, the amount you have is greater and greater. And this game can be modified if you have kids who are working that are a little bit lower level, you could only do it with two digits, have them only draw two cards each time. Equally, if you're working with kids who are at a much higher level, they can draw four or five. There's really no limit, and as many children as want to can play with it as long as there's enough cards. Again, this is also something that can be used to practice computational skills. Um, you would have one deck of cards that's just the numbers. And then you would have another deck of cards that are computational signs, like division, multiplication, subtraction, addition. Obviously, you're going to choose which ones based on your students' ability levels. And then the kids just draw, if they're practicing addition, for example, they might draw two cards and add those together. If they're at a higher ability level, they might draw four cards and make two-digit numbers and practice what have you, multiplication or division with that. But they're really simple material that can be used lots of ways. And it's a really, really good way as a teacher to get a handle on whether or not they have a solid understanding of number sense. Dice can also be used in a very similar way. Obviously, you can buy dice pretty cheaply, and that might be easiest. But it's also having children and students make them in the classroom is a really great way to get them engaged with the material and the tools right away. Um, so all it is is just in the form of a cross, six evenly placed squares uh, with the appropriate number of dots for each side. And then they fold it up, tape it, and they end up with something like this. And they can use these much the same way. If you have children at a lower level, they might just roll two dice and add or subtract those two numbers. If they are more advanced, they might use four dice and to create two-digit numbers. Um, and they can also do multiplication and division with this. One thing that I do want to mention at this point with both this tool and the previous one is that one concern that a lot of people have um, when it comes to using these materials and allowing for individualized instruction is that their students might not be able to, might not actually be working while they are doing small group lessons. So like if you leave your children with the dice or the number cards, maybe they're just throwing the dice at each other and they're not actually doing anything. But there's really easy ways to make your students accountable for their work during this time. You can just give them a sheet of paper and ask them, tell them, you know, you have 10 minutes to be working with the dice. In those 10 minutes, I want to see you complete X number of problems. And they have to write down, you know, however many multiplications, additions, whatever it is they did using the dice. Um, again, with the number cards, that's a really great place for them to practice using 
greater than, less than, and equal symbols, which can be quite a challenge for a lot of kids. Just ask them if they're playing with their partner for 10 minutes. In those 10 minutes, they probably should come up with 15 number pairs, and they can use those signs to show which number was greater than or less than. And then they can give that information to you, and as a teacher, that's a great way to evaluate your students' ability to grasp the concepts that they are supposedly working on. Um, just to emphasize that, just because students are working individually doesn't mean that you as a teacher won't have a chance to evaluate that work or to monitor what they're doing. OK, I'm going to transfer to tools for teaching reading. Um, where I have another question at this point for you regarding what teachers struggle most with, in your opinion, when teaching reading. We're going to try one more time, and hopefully this time it'll go up and a little smoother. So I will touch on some tools for comprehension towards the end, but I'm going to go in kind of the order that students learn to read, which is first, obviously, letter sound correspondence, and then fluency, vocabulary, and then comprehension at the end. Um, and before going into these tools, one thing that's really challenging about reading, math kind of lends itself to using manipulatives, to using concrete things, because it's so clearly connected to our everyday lives. But reading is really, really abstract. And those of us who are fluent readers, we kind of forget all the things that we are requiring of our students to do in order to become not just fluent readers, but critical readers. And that is being able to understand, you know, that a pair of lines that's drawn on the board has a sound, and that that particular sound, when connected to another sound, or really what we're asking them to do is to connect one abstract drawing to another drawing to create a word, and then that word connected with other words has some sort of greater meaning. That's a really, if you think about it that way, it's a really challenging thing to ask some students. So although traditionally I think reading has definitely been taught in a way where you know there's one way to learn to read. You're shown the words on the board, and you learn to read those words. It's something that we should definitely attempt to make a little bit more concrete, especially for those of our readers who are struggling and for whom that might just present a real challenge to their particular learning style. So the first tool I'm going to talk about would be for those students who need help with connecting one letter to one sound. Um, and they're sandpaper letters. And so if you think about it, there's really very few, if any, opportunities for students to interact in a physical way when they're, with the letters when they're learning to read. They see them on the paper. They see them on the board. Um, but there's no real way to touch them, to connect with them in any other way. So this is an attempt to do that. Um, so you see I have mine here. Actually, this looks backwards. But all you do with the student is you have them take their finger. And sandpaper is really rough, so it's easy for them to get a sense of what, uh, to get a strong sense of its shape. And you have them trace with their finger, obviously in the correct way. And while they're tracing, say the name of the letter, D, and the sound, duh. And it's really important that they do that at the same time so that they're connecting the sound, uh, the shape, excuse me, with the sound and the name of the letter. And then, when they've done that several times, it's also a good chance to have them write that same letter on paper or to look for it in a book. Because we know that a lot of times our struggling readers, part of the problem is that they have a hard time knowing that a D like this that they see in sandpaper makes the same sound as the D that they see in their book or the D that they see written on the board. So. Again, if you have children who seem like they really need to be able to touch things and to be able to use their hands in order to learn, this is a great place to start with them. So moving on, once you have students who have some ability, you know, that one-to-one -one ability to know, recognize the letter and the sound it makes, you need them to be able to form simple syllables. And so this is also a tool used in Montessori. It's called a syllable tree. And you can see it in the slide as well. I am going to go ahead and make a disclaimer since uh, I work in the Dominican Republic. This is a tool that definitely works better with Spanish because Spanish lends itself to teaching in syllables. And because Spanish does not also have 
the issue that arises with long versus short vowel sounds, but it, it's still useful in English as well. Um, but essentially what it is, is on your syllable tree, you have your vowels, and then you would ask, you would begin by taking a consonant. M and P is always an easy way to start because they make very distinctive sounds. And have your student match, you move the consonant to different vowels and read that syllable. So if it was M, it would be ma, mo, and then maybe they would do P, po, pa. Um, one thing is you definitely want to teach students use this activity with two consonants because what I find is that if you teach a student and you really focus on one consonant and all the vowels, you might think, oh, they've really got it. They can read ma, they can read mi, mo. They've got that down. And then when you change to a P, they try to make the same sound. So instead of saying pa, they are going to say ma. And the reason they do that is because they haven't clearly understood that depending on the consonant, the sound is going to change. And what they've mastered is that they think now each consonant with each vowel makes the same type of sound. Uh, another mistake that you want to avoid making is always putting the consonant before the vowel, which is definitely our tendency as teachers. But if we think about it, not all words begin with a consonant. So at the same time you're teaching them to read M-A, ma, you want them to read A-M, um. Because otherwise, when they come across a letter that starts, uh, sorry, a word that starts with a, a vowel, they're going to be really struggle to do that. And then what you can do once they have maybe mastered the process of doing, of reading syllables with one consonant, think about syllables in your language that go with a lot of vowels. So, for example, I have, and this is laminated. So it's clear in the middle, so the student understands that in that clear spot they're supposed to put another letter. And they can just move it along the tree like this, like mal, mel, mol. And they don't necessarily all need to be real words, but the point is that the student can maneuver this along the different vowels and read words to themselves. And again, it's pretty, it's nice, so it's something that they will enjoy using. Once you have students who have kind of really begun to decode words, obviously the next step that you're working towards is fluency. And one thing that I've learned with my students, particularly those who are having difficulty reading, is that it's really important to give them a base from which to build their reading skills. And what I mean by that is I really work with a lot of them on memorizing the 100 most common sight words, what are called sight words, in their respective languages. Um, and the reason for that is, obviously, you don't want students to be thinking that they can memorize every word to read, because that is not going to work. But if they learn to recognize on sight the 100 most common words, those do form a large majority of the text they will use. Oh, sorry, the text they will read. And if they're reading very basic books, that means that maybe at, if they know those words, they can read 80% of the text without having to really struggle too much and reserve their mental ability and their energy for trying to decode those words that are a little more difficult. Um, so obviously, if you want kids to memorize words, a great word way to do that is by playing memory. Um, again, a really simple game. Once you have taught them, say, a group of 10 or 20 words of the 100 most common, what you can do is you can write or you can type them up so that they're, I don't know if you can quite see that, but a size that children will easily be able to read. The important thing is to make sure that on the back they're covered with some type of paper that is going to keep students from cheating by just being able to see what the word is when it's turned over. Um, but once you have, uh, and obviously since it's memory, you make a pair of each one, and you give them to kids so they might have 10 or 20 words that they're practicing, they shuffle them, they put them face down on a board or a table, and then they play with their partner to find the two that are matching. Um, now, the thing about this game is that it's really important that the children, each time they flip over a card, 
whether it's matching the one that they have or not, that they read the word. Because obviously that's the goal, is that they're going to read these words so many times that they're going to get ingrained to their memory and they no longer will have to think about what the word is when they encounter it. So it is important that when this game is being played that the teacher is somewhere nearby so that they can at least hear and ensure that the students are meeting, um, are actually reading while they're playing the game. Because you will have kids sometimes who obviously can match the two words based purely on visual recognition, but don't read them. And in that case, that's definitely a didactic tool that loses its purpose. Um, this is another tool that can be used for another level as well. If you have students who are doing vocabulary, um, you would use one card. When creating these cards, you would use one card for the word, that's backwards, and the other card would have the definition on it. Uh, and in this case, the students are looking to match the word with the definition. So if the word's didactic, for example, the definition would be something intended to be used to teach. Um, and they can match those up. A really great way to hold them accountable in this case would be once they finish the game, they have to write a sentence using the words that they ended up with, that they won during the game. Wordo, which is basically bingo, but with words, is also a really fun way to reinforce both fluency and vocabulary. Uh, the example I have here would have been used for teaching kids specifically vocabulary words. These cards, the important thing to keep in mind is to have them laminated, because you don't want to have to write one of these every single time you play with the students. But you can have them laminated, and that way, they are in charge of choosing from their vocabulary list nine or ten or however many squares you have, um, nine or ten of the words, and writing them in on their card. And then once they're done, they can just erase them. So with something like this, what would happen is if the students have chosen which words from their vocabulary list they want to put on, then the teacher would be reading the definition. So again, if one of my words, for example, was didactic and the teacher reads out, a tool used, uh, intended to be used for teaching, I cross that off. Um, and I keep doing that until maybe I, you can either do it that they get it all in a row, or in this case, since it's not a lot, that they reach blackout point. Um, but again, because it's a game and they can win, they're going to be more eager to really learn the definitions of the words. If you have kids who are learning their 100 sight words, it's even more simple. You just ask them to write down nine of the 20 words they might be working on at that point, and they can then listen, you know, they listen to the teacher to say the word, and once she says it, if they recognize it and they can read it, they'll be able to cross it off. Okay, and finally, I wanted to talk just a little bit about some things that can be used for comprehension. Because comprehension is definitely the big, big challenge in teaching to read. I think a lot of us have learned strategies and have found tools that we can use um, that can help us increase comprehension. Uh, sorry, help us make kids fluent readers. But then we get those students, and I'm sure everyone who has had them, who can read an entire book, and then you ask them what they have read, and they have no idea what just happened in the last 20 pages or so which is really frustrating because then reading is kind of a pointless skill if you're not actually learning anything from it. Um, so first of all, going back to the last two games I was talking about, I do think that building vocabulary is really, really important. It's sometimes something that gets overlooked or is taught very at random, and yet we know that if kids don't understand 5 or 10% of the words on the page, they're going to have a very difficult time understanding the main idea of the story or getting something out of a nonfiction text. So definitely focus a lot, a lot on vocabulary. And that, I have seen, really increases students' comprehension if they're not trying to guess what every other word is meaning. And then something else that is really good are thinking maps. Um, I think you can see in this slide there's two examples that I've used here. Thinking maps are important because they allow kids to break down a concept into simple steps. Sometimes when we teach comprehension skills like summary, what we might say to a child is, OK, you've read this book. Now I want you to write me a paragraph 
about the most important uh, things that happened in that book. And that's a really overwhelming task if you think about it. To write an entire paragraph about a book you just read it sounds pretty daunting if you don't have a really good grasp of how to do that already. So a thinking map is a good place to start with those basic comprehension skills. Um, at the top of this particular sheet of paper, you can see, there's again, it's in Spanish, excuse me, but first, next, last. And in each square, the idea is that the children would write what happened first in the book, what happened last in the book, and what happened at the end. Uh, and then they could use that later on to actually write a, a paragraph summary. And then the second one is, again, it, it's very basic. But in the middle, it asks them to write the main idea and surrounding it, the details. And obviously, this thinking map, part of what it is is a visual representation of what ideas are most important. So the main idea is in the center because it's core to the story. It's what is most important for them to learn. And then the details are kind of surrounding. Those of you who are familiar with Venn diagrams, that's also a great way to teach comparison. Because um, we really know what kids need to do in order to comprehend is to be able to summarize, to be able to compare, and to be able to infer and then make some sort of evaluation or take a lesson from what they read. So those are really the tools I had to share today. Um, and I just wanted to end by keeping a couple of things in mind when you begin to use these types of materials in the classroom. The first is to only begin with one or two per subject, because it can be really exciting to see how that these tools will allow students to become independent learners and allow you as a teacher perhaps to do more individualized instruction. But we need to make sure not to overwhelm our students by giving them too many new games, too many new activities that they need to master. Because when we do it all at once and we don't give them sufficient time to really learn how to do each one, what ends up happening is that they don't really know either what they're supposed to be getting out of each specific activity or uh, they simply learn to use it in an incorrect way. So really important to take your time, do it slowly, only introduce, two is a maximum, but really start with one per week maybe in each subject. Secondly would be to make sure that you are modeling everything you do. Um, children learn best when they see other people do it. Again, because the whole idea of didactic tools is to make something abstract, concrete. We don't want to explain abstractly to our students what they're supposed to do in this new activity. We want to show it to them, not just once, but multiple times. And then finally, the idea of mastery before independence. Uh, a game like memory is really fun, and kids can really use it to increase their, their reading abilities, but only if they truly understand what they're supposed to do, only if they really do know how, how to read those words already. Thank you.